Uh, one of the things I always talk to people about is brand recognition. And that is you may not, and there may be no way to measure a one-to-one -one correlate when it comes to return on investment, um, but you'll see some increase in numbers, but it depends too on who your client is. We have made it episode number 14 of the In Focus podcast. Folks, we're at the end of season number two with this episode. Thanks so much for tuning in to season number two. Hope you enjoyed the guest lineup that we had. I am Austin Black, your host with Backward Productions, and we are focusing on making marketing campaigns that your customers cannot ignore. Part of that is video strategy. And this podcast is designed to help you create the strategy that you need to win with video. Video is the number one marketing method. It's compelling, it's engaging, it works, but only if you do it right. And we wanna help you do it right. We wanna help you win with video. So we have this podcast to guide you through the seven steps that we use to create a video strategy that actually gets results and that works for brands just like yours. Folks, as we wrap up season number two, I am very excited for this last conversation with Matt Breckwell. Matt is actually a fellow podcaster. He owns a podcasting business and his business is essentially centered around data and performance. So when it comes to podcasting, the numbers are what matter. So we're gonna talk about measuring your performance, measuring your campaign, your success, how do you determine that? And what's really awesome about this conversation is we've learned that even though numbers don't lie, it's not all about the numbers. So stay tuned as we visit with Matt Breckwald and find out how you can create success within your video marketing campaign. Hey folks, we're here on the In Focus podcast. I've got my good buddy, Matt Breckwald. Uh, from out in Idaho, the Potato State is with us today. Uh, Matt is a prolific podcaster in the agriculture sector. Uh, he started the Off Farm Income podcast, is the host of the Microphone Money podcast, and numerous other shows pertaining to the agriculture industry. And I am so glad to have him today as we talk about uh, measuring the success of your campaign. Um, Matt has, has done a lot of things with his business in recent years that uh, is very, um, very impressive. We'll just say that he has kind of taken an idea and, and started from scratch and made it be a real true business model. And, uh, and it's all about major success for his business, I think. And so I'm looking forward to uh, his insight today as we talk about measuring the success of a video campaign. So Matt, welcome to the Unfocus podcast. Uh, glad to have you here today. Hey, thanks so much. It's good to uh, talk with you and see you face to face again, Austin. You bet. Well, Matt, uh, why don't you start off with just telling us a little bit about yourself, about your business, and uh, give us some background on your experience within this world. All right. And I got to apologize. You asked me what I wanted in my bio. I should have mentioned the Corn Revolution podcast. We're just, right. uh, matter yeah. of fact, uh, I just spoke with the producer of that show today. And so... We're recording season three starting next week, and uh, it's going to be a lot, a lot more episodes than we've ever done. So uh, awesome. it's pretty exciting for me to be doing that. That's pretty cool. Uh, but let's see. I uh, so I've got an ag degree uh, from from Montana State. Got a lot of pride going on here, <laughs> and uh, so I've got an animal science degree from there. But I actually ended up being a police officer for 15 years after I got that degree. And then my wife and I bought a farm, finally came back to the farm, and I decided I wanted to be done uh, working as a police officer. I wanted to start my own business. So I started in an ag business, uh, actually exterminating pocket gophers. I don't know if you have those in Missouri, but we certainly have them out here in the West. I started that business, and everything went well. I ended up leaving my day job. Uh, we had our own farm, which we were still developing. It started off just as nothing but weeds. And... Uh, I had that and I was really inspired and so I decided to start Off Farm Income, which is my original podcast. And I started interviewing entrepreneurs in agriculture. And then that snowballed a little. I started interviewing FFA students who had entrepreneurship projects or supervised agricultural experiences. And that snowballed a little bit and National FFA hired me to start doing interviews for them for their satellite radio show FFA Today. And then I approached a local farm and ranch retailer uh, with an idea to produce a podcast for them. 
I figured if National FFA wanted me to do that for them, other companies might want me to as well. Um, they said yes to that. I'm still doing that show for them. Now it's a podcast only. And it's kind of been drawn back. But for three years, we did one radio show and one podcast a week uh, for, for that company. Uh, I mentioned the Corn Revolution podcast. I got found uh, by an advertising agency called Bader Rudder who was doing a campaign for Pioneer Seed Company, and they hired me to host the Corn Revolution podcast, and we're recording season number three. Uh, as we're as you and I are recording this today, we're starting recording season number three next week. And uh, and then what, I, I, I uh, ended up producing a podcast. I still produce and edit a podcast for a company out near you in Missouri uh, called the Bulkloads, uh, bulkloads.com, and it's a Bulkloads podcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure, oh, and there's Microphone Money. I just, my last episode of Microphone Money, I released it on Monday. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I did wrap that, I wrapped that project up. I wanted to teach people about how I had formed my podcasting business. And, and I got to the point where I was like, I think I've got it done. Uh, so I wrapped that one up on Monday. So I don't know, there's probably something else out there I'm forgetting, but that's kind of the, that's kind of the bulk of it. We've got a, 25 acre farm here in Idaho. We raise cattle as our main thing. And then uh, we raise pigs and goats too. So you, you got a little bit of everything there. You've kind of uh, been the jack of all trades and master of many. I know uh, with, with the farming, you have a, <clears throat> a variety of things going on there and also have, have done a lot in, in other sectors to really appreciate the agriculture world. And of course, with your podcast, um, it, it's been very interesting to, get to know your business and get to know you and kind of follow what all you have going on with those. And I think it's something that we can really learn a lot from, especially when it comes to uh, creating and measuring success. And that's something that uh, your business has kind of redefined, I guess you might say, you know, what, what success is, especially in that industry. Um, <clears throat> so with that in mind, walk me through just the, the growth of your business and um, how you were able to capture, uh, you know, to define that success for your, for your business. Cause I know you've talked several times about, uh, when it comes to podcasting, you know, the way that success is measured is, is one thing and you have kind of been able to redefine that. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna try to tie this in with videos we talked today. Um, but I want to start off because your business that that's what it's built around is, is the success of, of, of what you do. Um, so walk me through how you have redefined success of your business. Okay. Well, so when I first began, the measure of success that you heard from everybody when it came to podcasting were download numbers. How many downloads could you get per episode? And I, you know, when I started off farm income, my goal was to position myself as a nationwide expert in a small niche. So I refer to that as being a small fish in a small pond, uh, but you're the only fish in that pond. So it doesn't matter how big a fish you are. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was my goal. Uh, I didn't think that I was, I didn't think I had the personality or the cachet or whatever you want to call it to draw in these huge audiences. Like some people had been able to do. I just did not think that was my strength. So I thought I would focus in on a really, really small niche and I would become the go-to person on that particular niche. Now my audience has grown over time to respectable numbers. And now I've got advertisers on off farm income, but I never did it by the old model. The old model was um, basically the, the threshold you needed for success was about 10,000 downloads per episode. I'm nowhere near that. I've never gotten anywhere close to that. And I've even heard 5,000 downloads per episode and I'm nowhere near that. And I've never got anywhere close to that. But what I did do, is I did, I did realize that my show spoke to a very, very niche audience, but everybody in that audience is the same. And there wasn't a whole lot of people doing what I was doing. And so there's value there for people if they wanna reach that audience. And so one of the, I guess, one of the measures of success that, that I use on my show is the fact that I've created value for other companies to be part of my show, uh, for my sponsors to be part of my show, even though I don't hit those huge per episode download thresholds. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's one measure of success. 
And I think the other measure of success is that I've been able to connect with people all over the country, like yourself. Um, and I've been able, when I have the opportunity to sit down face to face with people I've met through the podcast, like yourself and, you know, share a meal or, or whatever and visit. And I've grown a network of contacts all throughout the United States in agriculture and farming. I've learned a ton about farming, about different entrepreneurial ventures in agriculture. And I've been able now to profile, you know, some 800 odd people uh, through the podcast and share their stories with everybody else throughout the nation. A lot of people in Canada, England, Australia, and share these stories of agriculture and, um, and share what these people are doing. And, and I, I'm kind of like a podcaster for the common guy. Um, you know, my guess, I don't go after the, I don't, well, I mean, don't get me wrong. I would take, I would take big time name guests on my show and I've done okay sometimes and in interviewing some folks that have a, a huge following already, but I love profiling the little guy, the guy that nobody else would ever talk about. Um, but I take an interest in that. And to me, it's very interesting. And there's other people out there that are interested in that too, because they hear that story and they go, that's just somebody just like me. And I could do that too. Yeah. And I like being the voice of that person. I enjoy doing that. And so for me, that's another, another measure of success is I bring stories to people on a weekly basis that, um, maybe other people would never take an interest in. And I say, well, why wouldn't you? These are pretty cool. Right. It's interesting. Once you, you break through the clout and, and, get, yeah. and really get to, get to know someone, you know, I've visited with people whenever I'm writing articles, they're, they're not a big famous person. They really, they seldom get off the farm. You know I mean? They, they kind of stay themselves, but they have such a unique perspective and you can learn so much from them. If mm -hmm. you take aside what this person does and who they are and just learn you know, what their story is, we, we can all learn something from everybody. And it's so fun to tell those stories, especially when it's someone that you, you don't really expect them to have a lot to share. And you wind up finding out that they have a lot to share. Well, you know, it's interesting. There's, um, there are, there are people out there with a ton of knowledge and they figured out how to do something and they're experts in it but they're not the type of person that is going to go out and they're going to proactively share their message. Right. Um, you know, they're humble. Uh, they're not looking to be an influencer or anything like that. So they've got something going on that's brilliant, but it's just kept to themselves, not for any other reason than they just don't think to go out and talk to about themselves. Mm -hmm. And so part of my job on off farm income is to dig those people up and to bring those stories out because otherwise, they're never ever going to get told except maybe in a very, very small circle of people. And one of the ways I've always gone about finding these folks is Craigslist. I will just sit there and go through Craigslist in all these different small towns throughout the United States, looking for something that's interesting yeah. on farm and ranch services and call these people up. And, you know, probably two out of, five times people think I'm some sort of scammer and they hang up on me and I can't get through to them because who's going to call this person up and want to do an interview with them. Right. If they even know what the podcast is at that yeah. point. Um, but then the people I get through to, they see I'm genuine. I'm real. I don't want anything from them other than the interview mm -hmm. and to tell their story. And honestly, without somebody digging these stories up, there's just a, there's a, there's a whole pool of really valuable information out there in the world and in the nation that otherwise it's just, it's just going to live and die with this one person. Yeah. It's just going to go away. So uh, it's pretty cool to be able to find that and be able to share it with other people. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that I have, have grown to love about video production <clears throat> is you find someone that, you know, again, they, they aren't going to share their story. You know, you're working with a brand and you're telling a story about their client and that client normally is not going to go out and toot their own horn. They're not going to go out and publicize, but they have such a unique perspective, a unique story. And if you really dig into that, you create such a, a connection and a relationship with that person. And that's what these brands are trying to accomplish with these video campaigns is personalize that brand and, and bring the human element into it 
and that's only accomplished through story. That's why, you know, you, you have, you know, I have so much fun with this industry because we get to, to tell those stories and to connect with people and to help brands grow their business through those. And that's one of the things that I think, uh, as you've been visiting with, with marketing agencies about video, you've probably kind of found, you know, what the core, um, the core result around those campaigns is. So why don't you uh, walk through a little bit some of the what you've learned in the past you know, couple of years as you've been visiting with agencies when it comes to a video campaign. Um, what are what are agencies looking for? Or what have you seen within your own business that um, that makes the success and the performance of your campaign so important? Well, I mean, admittedly, I'm going to know a lot more about audio um podcasts than i am about video production but there's a couple parallels there that i think um go either way and and the thing that i think makes what you're doing and what i do very viable is um developing a deeper relationship with with the viewer or with the listener Mm -hmm. and i don't know you know there's there's not a way to do that on a radio show in my opinion and and you can try and do it through a blog but that requires somebody to sit down and read right. and with video and with audio they can consume that content uh, while they're doing something else now uh with audio if they want to watch or with video if they want to watch the video then obviously they've got to devote some time to looking at the screen mm-hmm. um but you know video is interesting in that if if somebody's willing to get outside the box with the way they consume it it's multi-purpose because they can stick it in their pocket in an iPhone and have it playing if it's on Facebook or if it's on YouTube or whatever it may be. And they can be consuming that um, mm-hmm. even if they're not looking at it. Uh, but then if they have the time, they can be, they can be looking at it and they can watch all the visuals that come with it as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that deeper connection, um, you know, people these days are looking for authenticity. And I think by doing these videos and telling company stories, um, we help to show that that authenticity, and we we can advance that relationship between the company and their potential customer a couple stages. And, you know, because the sales process, of course, isn't just I need something and then I buy it. There's right. got to be rapport building. People need to to build trust with who they're going to be purchasing from. They want to like who they're purchasing from, and with with audio interviews, with podcasts, with with uh, with videos we can help to build that relationship, develop that trust, make fans of that company. Uh, and I think that's, that's probably the, the most important part. Definitely. In our last season, I visited um, with a friend of mine that um, has been involved in marketing quite a bit. And, you know, he had all these engagement metrics he was looking at as far as video plays and, you know, your key performance indicators, your, your click through your rate, just all these different numbers and everything. And I think that you, know, you have to have all those. You have to know that your video is actually being seen, that people are responding to it, that people are engaging with it. But I love what you just said and the fact that it really comes down to making that connection. And if you can create that relationship with the person, you know, I think it's, it's a viable argument of do the numbers really matter as long as the connection is is true and authentic and genuine and i mean that's something that we probably really can't can't say yes or no either way on but i think that is such a unique measurement of success of how much of an impact do you truly make are you focused so are you focused entirely on do we get a hundred thousand views in this video or are you focused on do we connect with a thousand people or a hundred people or ten people you know what was our our interaction in, in the companies that you visited with, um, how do those two elements kind of play in, the, in with each other? Because obviously we've got to get that video seen. We have to get that campaign out there. But at the same mm-hmm. time, if no one truly engages with it and relates to it, it might be considered a waste of money. So have, have you seen any correlation between the hard set numbers and the actual relation side of what that campaign does? Well, you know, in terms of the numbers, um, I'm not always privy to all the numbers that my clients are seeing. Um, but I do know that uh, I always, so when I always look at it, I always look at it in terms of scalability. 
And when I, when I think about the videos like what you produce or the podcast that I do, um, I think about the scalability or the bang for the buck. And, and so the people that are tuning in to the type of content that we're talking about here are people that are already interested in that particular mm -hmm. category or whatever it may be. And so they're kind of a self-selected audience and they're there on purpose, which is a big deal uh, because they want to be there and they're interested in the topic. So if you are making videos for somebody that relates to their interest level or to their interests, then uh, it, it, you know, you've got like a hundred percent demographic of people who are in your target, your target market, mm -hmm. which is a big, big deal right. versus if you try and go the old fashioned way and you go like, just staying in agriculture, uh, Mahindra tractors, they advertise on the Rush Limbaugh radio show. Mm -hmm. Now, Rush Limbaugh is, he has an absolutely gigantic audience, right? but the guy is not a farmer, right? <laughs> he looks like in a palace in Florida somewhere. Right. He's not a farmer. So he's doing these live reads for <laughs> Mahindra tractors. Um, but I think everybody listening to this knows that he's probably never been on a tractor. I don't know. He right. grew up in Missouri. So maybe he's been on a tractor <laughs> when he's a kid. I don't know. But probably not recently, right? right. So uh, he's doing these live reads and he's probably never worked a hydrostatic clutch. He probably doesn't, you know, all these different things that go along with this mm -hmm. tractor. He probably doesn't know anything about it. So you're hearing this and you're like, I'm a Rush fan, so I'll give Mahindra a look, right? <laughs> yeah. But then you come to a show like mine and then all of a sudden, you hear an ad and it's about a product that I use and people who are listening are, are they're already interested versus on the Rush Limbaugh show. What, you know, what percentage demographic of that audience is farming? I don't know what the percentage is. Um, and even if it's 2%, that's still a lot of people, right. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but it's, but it's a percentage and you're hoping these people stay on the show through the commercials and um, you're hoping that there's enough people in that audience that, are, that would actually buy a tractor that your campaign is effective. Mm -hmm. But when you come to a, a show like mine or you come to a video production like what you do, you know that you're hitting everybody who's consuming that content is a potential customer. Yeah. And of course, it's not as expensive to be a sponsor of a show like mine to, to sell a tractor, to sell mm -hmm. a squeeze chute, to sell, you know, whatever, lacrosse rubber boots, you know one of my sponsors. It's not nearly as expensive as it would be to go on a show like that, but everybody in my audience has a use for the product that you're advertising. And everybody in my audience knows a lot about me and they know that I'm actually using these products. So when I say they're good, there's so much credibility behind that versus I'm obviously reading a script because somebody paid me to. So I think that's a big deal. Definitely. Uh, you know, as you're talking there, I'm thinking about, uh, how brands will will do their advertising because you know you look at we'll take the super bowl commercial for example mm -hmm. and you know th those companies i mean your your video itself cost a million dollars your advertising i forget what it was this year but I, for some reason i'm thinking like five million plus just for the ad itself so you've already got you know six to seven million dollars <clears throat> in one commercial for one tv show you're yeah. blasting it out to millions of people. Okay, you know, what percentage of people are actually going to go buy a Ford truck? Now, I'm a Ford guy, so I like that. So hopefully, you know, more yeah. people are going to do that. But you know that you're not going to really probably sell a lot of trucks off that commercial. But it's interesting because everyone's going to talk about that commercial. And, and everyone right. is going to, uh, to remember it. And you're kind of building your brand loyalty around that. Um, so, mm -hmm. so I think it's also important to, to not be too focused in what do we want to accomplish? Who are we targeting? How are we getting this message out there? You know, granted you and I kind of work on smaller scale clients who we are wanting to maximize the return on our investment when they're out, you know, they're not spending millions of dollars, but the money they do spend, it needs to generate a return. Um, right. but I think we, we have to, we have to sometimes think outside that box, I think on, who are we connecting with? What do we expect them to do? Do we want them to buy or just know about us or just tell their friends or just frankly like watching our video? You know, <laughs> I mean, several different things to think about. So I, I love that, that analogy of, 
um, again, you know, thinking outside that box and, and how can you connect with someone who may never buy from you, but at least they know about you, you know? Hey, everybody. I want to take a quick minute and tell you about the video strategy workshop here at Backward Productions. If you've made it this far, you know all the steps involved. You know what it takes to create an effective video marketing strategy. You know the elements that you need to decide, that you need to create, that you need to measure and monitor before you ever start recording your videos. But maybe you're realizing, man, this is a lot of work and I just don't have the time. I don't understand it completely. I know I need to do it, but I just need help. That's the very reason we have our video strategy workshop to help you create that strategy, to create that campaign that actually gets results. We visit with you and your team about your business, about your products and your services, your customers, your current marketing efforts, and we determine exactly how you can use video in your marketing campaign. We create the structured, customized outline that guides you, gives you a map for what videos to use, how to use them, where to go with them, what they're supposed to accomplish, how to measure the success. So you know as soon as you start investing the money to the production, it's going to work, you're going to get a return, you're going to know exactly how it performed. For more information on how to get signed up for the strategy workshop, visit backroad-productions.com slash workshops. Schedule your consultation, we'll walk you through the process, and we'll help you start winning with video marketing strategy. Folks, let's return back to my conversation with Matt Breckwald. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. You bring up that, you bring up a, a commercial of the Super Bowl. Um, you know, pickups are expensive. I've got a Ford truck sitting out in the driveway too. And pickups are expensive, but even with them being expensive, what's the profit margin on that truck? And then multiply that by how many trucks to get to $6 million or more. <laughs> And man, that's a lot of pickups. So you've got to wonder what else they know, um, you know, in terms of the importance of being an advertiser and, and spending that much money. Cause that is a lot, a lot of trucks. Definitely. So let, let's kind of tone our scale back a little bit and talk some more realistic projects um, with some of the brands that we work with. Um, do you think that that brand should be focused on more of that awareness of that broad reach or do they need to kind of keep the, the wrap on where they're spending their money and try to actually generate sales through video? Well, um, I think that, so I think that they do need to try and generate sales through, through video. I mean, you know, of course, when you approach somebody and you say, I want to do this project for you, um, the first thing they want to know is what's it going to cost. The next thing they want to know is return on investment. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's our job to explain to them the other things, the peripheral things that come with this. Uh, one of the things I always talk to people about is brand recognition. And that is you may not, and there may be no way to measure a one-to-one -one correlate when it comes to return on investment, um, but you'll see some increase in numbers, but it depends too on who your client is. Um, you know, so for example, you take a client who sells a product in retail locations, you may have some call to action on your video or whatever that may be saying, go to this website and use this promo code. And, um, you know, you can get a 10% discount or something like that. Who knows, you know, how it's all built together, how it's all put together. But if you do that, a certain percentage of people will probably do that. But if you try and measure the efficacy, of that entire campaign through that, it's it's kind of a misnomer because people might be developing that relationship with your brand, but they don't need that product today. Yeah. And then three months down the road, they need that product, they're in whatever location where they can buy it, and they remember the ad, or they just get a warm feeling, they don't even remember the, the video. Mm -hmm. They just get a warm feeling about the product because of what they experienced through the video, and they make that purchase because they just like that brand. They look at the brands available and they go, man, I like that one right there. I, they have brand loyalty. They might even be able to explain why, but the root of that might be that video. Yeah. So there's a residual effect there as well. So I think we need to be careful when we try and we try and dry, draw a direct correlation on return on investment or um, sales you're going to get out of this. And is this going to be profitable? 
because you've got to take into account with what we're doing with content marketing and deepening these relationships that we're looking at two, three, four, maybe 10 purchases over a lifetime, maybe more. They're going to come at random times and these people won't be able to explain why they want your brand. They right. just want your brand. And it all goes back to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is, that is so true, especially whenever you're looking at the number of contact points you have to have with that person to generate that sale. I mean, I know I'm probably guilty of, of seeing something that I just, I need right then and now I don't really know about the brand, but I'm, I need to go buy it. Other times mm -hmm. you, you hear about a brand for 10 years before you actually go and buy anything. I mean, you know, I, I know everything about Powder River. I still haven't bought a Powder River suit just because I don't need one right now. <laughs> you know? right. That, but at, at, at some point, it may be years down the road, that continual brand awareness, brand recognition, brand loyalty finally comes to the point where I'm ready to buy a squishy. I'm ready to buy a tub. I'm ready to, to buy into that brand and what they have to offer. And yeah, you never know what's going to happen. It's always important to be out there in front of them. With, with that said, then, as you're looking at different campaigns, whether it be a specific marketing campaign or a longer term branding run, how long do you think customer brands should really focus on, on pushing a campaign or pushing a product or, or investing in video marketing for this one area, this one topic before deciding either one, it's not working, we're not generating any sales or two, it needs to go longer because we haven't quite got it figured out or this is going really, really good. Let's keep fueling this. I mean, there, there's, there's a decision in there at some point. Um, so what do you think should be some, some uh, decision based uh, criteria for how to decide when to fuel it, when to cut the plug and when just to be satisfied with what it is and call it quits? Well, I will say, I think at the beginning of a campaign uh, when when you're sitting down and, and you're deciding what you're going to do, you need to draw up your definition of success right then, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You need to say, this is what we consider success. And then the expert that you're hiring that's going to help you construct this campaign, do the videos, whatever, they can sit there and go, yeah, that's not a realistic, <laughs> uh, you know, that's not a realistic idea of success here. Mm -hmm. Here's what you should expect from something like this. but. Here's why this is still valuable. And so, um, you know, in my opinion, that's all, that should be predetermined at the outset. You don't want somebody, and by the way, for those of us who sell these services, if we start a campaign with a client and they don't have a clear understanding or we don't together have a clear understanding of what success is, shame on us because we should have, right. we should have set those parameters at the beginning and made that very, very clear. Um, so they can figure out what that is and where it's going and understand things like what I was talking about, like residual benefits and long-term mm -hmm. benefits and things like that. Um, to think that the, that we're going to put a video out there and all of a sudden, you know, sales compared to this time next last year are going to be up by 15%. I don't know. Maybe that is something we can do realistically in certain situations mm -hmm. and maybe in other situations we go, look, this is a long-term play but your the return on the investment is here. Um, or maybe a video is targeted mm -hmm. at one particular line, one particular product that a company makes, and you go, you're gonna see results here. You may want 10% more sales in this particular product, and but I'm gonna tell you right now, you're gonna get 4% more, but what you're also building is brand recognition for all of your products, everything that's got that brand yeah. stamped on it. So you know, I, and I just don't know. I don't think there's going to be a bright line unless you get it really specific. I don't think there's going to be a bright line you can point to, to say success or failure. Yeah. I think there's some, some vagaries in this and there's some things going on out there in the psyche of the people that we want to turn into to our customers that there's just no way for us to measure. It's interesting as, as you were talking there, I thought of uh, a book I've been reading recently by Donald Miller um, called Marketing Made Simple. And one of the things it's you know, about building a sales funnel and creating those expectations of how many people you're actually going to target and, and get in your funnel and, and how success is going to look like. And he talks about you basically you have to set three numbers on, on, on your list. You have to have your, your goal, 
of what you would, you know, what you think you want to attain. You have to have your realistic goal of what you're actually going to be happy with, which is, you know, mm-hmm. or sorry, I, I said that wrong. Your, your number of, of which of what you're going to be happy with is your goal. Then your number of this would be awesome. If this, you know, if we yeah. hit this goal, this like be our dream gangbuster. We knocked it out of the park goal. And then your number of this didn't work at all. We need to really revamp this. And as, as long as you have those three numbers, then you can measure uh, you know, did you succeed? Did you really perform well? Or did you hit a real loser of a campaign and you need to revisit this? Mm-hmm. And I think we, we always seem to focus on, well, we're just going to get as, as good as we can. And we're going to, you know, go after there and push it and, and hope we do really well. And then, okay, well, we got 10 sales. Was that success? Was that not, you know, we got a hundred emails. Well, we're like 500, you know, what is your, what is your expectation? Because for some people, you know, a thousand dollars in sales is a big deal for them. For others, if they don't get a hundred thousand, then it's a failure. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, true to your point there, having those, those parameters uh, is going to change in every project. But if you don't know even where to start, uh, then you're never going to have a true measurement and know if you succeeded or failed. You know, that's interesting too, is, is the definition of success or failure always going to be based on sales numbers or could it be based on numbers of views? Right. You know, with, with these platforms we're putting videos out on, we can see right then and there how many people have watched it in some cases, how long they've watched it all the Mm -hmm. way through. Um, can we base success on that too? Can we base our definition of success there? Definitely. <clears throat> you know, I think it all comes back to, you know, what is your, as we talk about earlier steps in this process, what is your purpose? What is your, is your mission? What's your call to action? Yeah. Cause like you said, I mean, it, we may not be trying to build sales. We may just be trying to get more Facebook page likes or people to go to our website or just, you know, that brand awareness, in which case we just want as many eyeballs and shares and likes on there as possible to create that engagement and we don't care if we draw a dollar off of any revenue. We just need to get people to know about us. Some right. campaigns, by golly, we better sell some stuff for this. is going to be a waste of money. So it's important to go back and, and establish that purpose of that mission of who are you targeting? What do you want them to do? Um, you know, where are you going with this video? Because yeah, it's not always going to be the same measurement um, of, of how you define the performance. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, Matt, I think we've had a, a great discussion here and, uh, you know, it's the topic that it, it's, it's been narrow, but there are so many different ways to look at it. And I, I really appreciate, uh, the insight that you brought today about just the whole relationship and the connection and that being something that, uh, we can't ignore whenever it comes to measuring the success and performance and understanding that it's different for every project, for every client, for every video, um, every time, uh, you know, it's never going to be the same mm-hmm. measurement. So uh, as we wrap up here, uh, any final thoughts you have in regard to this whole concept and how you've seen it uh, work within your business and your clients? Well, I'll tell you, I think um, it seems so mainstream, but I still think we're on the front end. Yeah. I still think that this is coming. Uh, there's going to be so much more of this. Um, I don't see any reason why people would want to move away from authenticity. I think people really enjoy authenticity. I think people like to feel good about where they're spending their money. Uh, you know, people, people like to define that as, uh, they like to define that as, I feel good about my company. My company, you know, they, they give, they donate money to the homeless or they clean up the oceans or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, I think people, I think baseline people like that. They feel good about that. But I think what's even more important to people that maybe they don't talk about this is probably doesn't get spoken. But I think what's more important to people is when they spend their money on something, they they don't feel like they've been played for a fool. Yeah. And I don't think many people talk about that. Um, and so I don't see consumers, now that we've kind of taken the genie out of the bottle when it comes to being authentic, I don't see consumers wanting to put that genie back in. Right. Because I, I feel like they they really enjoy knowing a company better and feeling good about making that purchase, maybe because of the things the company is doing for social, social issues or whatever. 
but more unspoken, I feel good about this company because I feel like I've done my research and I feel like I've spent my money more wisely. That makes me feel better about myself as a consumer. I think that's, uh, there's probably a lot of people out there that are way smarter than me that have already figured that out. But I just have this gut feeling that that's part of this deal. Right. I think that that's a great uh, thing to keep in mind that yeah, marketing has changed. And, and if you aren't able to, to capture your followers and present them in, you know, involve them in a tribe and uh, help them connect and feel good about what they do, then <clears throat> probably not going to last very long. We're probably going to going to have a lot of issues with that. So I think that's a great point to bring up. Yeah. Well, I hope so. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks so much for joining with us today and for sharing your insights. And uh, I really appreciate uh, your time and sharing uh, just how success can be defined and it's always going to be different. So thanks for being with us today on the M focus. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Austin. Well, what a way to wrap up season number two. You know, to be honest, I didn't know what to expect from this conversation because it's so different from our normally what we talk about in terms of video strategy. But I love the insight that Matt shared that sometimes it's not all about the sales. It's not all about the numbers. It's about the relationship that you can build with your customers. And that's something that we can never forget. Marketing is about building relationships. So hopefully you enjoyed the insight, the information, the conversation that we had focused a pound around determining the success of your campaign and what it really does look like. If you want more information about mass business, about podcasting, check out the show notes, backroad-productions.com slash podcast. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in to the season number two of the In Focus podcast. Please leave us a review. Let us know what you thought of this season. Let us know what we can do to make it even better. We love getting your feedback, getting your reviews. So drop a line to us. And we look forward to coming back season number three. Thanks for tuning in to the In Focus podcast.